Good evening, O oh eagle-eyed handy viewer such as you are, and welcome to this very, very special uh, edition of uh, my blacksmith previews here on Beard Minis. Now, uh, this is kind of a, a good news, bad news situation where the good news significantly outweighs the bad news, I'm sure, as far as you are concerned. That bad news being that I will be spending the next month circumnavigating the globe, and as such, I will not be doing any further updates until the other side of Gen Con. The good news is I've spent this evening in the delightful conversation with senior developer at Steamforge, Mr. Jamie Perkins, who has given us a whole bunch more information about the Blacksmiths Guild, which I am now preparing for you. So, so without much further ado, I'll hand myself over to past me. So I am joined this evening by senior developer Jamie Perkins, who has agreed to come on to the Beer Minis channel and discuss the new Blacksmiths Guild with us. Absolutely fantastic. Jamie, thank you very much and welcome to the Beer, to the Beer Minis YouTube channel. Thank you for having me on. It's uh, something I'm looking forward to quite a lot. We've been waiting to talk about the Blacksmiths and uh, <laughs> this is pretty much my first opportunity to do so actually, so let's go for it. Brilliant. So let's start right at the very top just in case... Uh, no one has got a clue what they're talking about, although if they've ended up here by mistake, I'll be curious how. Um, Jamie, who are the Blacksmiths Guild? So the Blacksmiths are the brand new guild we've added to Guild Ball. Um, whenever we add a new guild, or even from the very beginning, when we were designing the first guilds for Guild Ball, uh, we wanted to make sure that all of the guilds were themed off uh, guilds that either have existed in real life or could have existed. So the, the Butchers, the Masons, for instance, guilds that have been around since the beginning, uh, have got very clear, strong identities, uh, have quite you know queer, cl clear themes when it comes to, like, say, butchers, butchery, chopping things up big cleavers, for instance. You know, we'll take them to a slightly cartoonish or, you know, a, a little bit, you know, take them to the edge of believability, perhaps. But there's some, still some very strong identity and identifi yeah. identifiable themes there uh, and that's no different with the blacksmith guild um here we wanted to take a very specific zoomed in look at the relationship between a master blacksmith and an apprentice blacksmith mm -hmm. uh, so even though the relationship sort of between master and apprentice is something that exists in quite a lot of trades around there, and it could have been something we could have existed in the other guilds that we've made already, it's something yeah. that we thought was particularly important to blacksmiths. Is when we did our sort of background research into sort of processes of blacksmithing and different ideas and themes that we could use to construct our models and ideas, it became quite apparent to us that this is sort of a very central thing to blacksmithing and the blacksmithing profession. Um, one of the first ideas that we came across, which is actually something that um, – appeared quite clearly in uh, Anvil and Sledge, uh, which is one of the reasons why they were some of the first blacksmiths to be shown, is this strong relationship between master and apprentice in terms sure. of what's called the blacksmith striking, which is where you have the master blacksmith actually doesn't have this sort of giant hammer at all. He has a very such sm small pointing hammer. When they're working on a very large piece of metal that needs to be hit with immense force to beat it into shape, it's actually the master blacksmith that has a small pointing hammer and he's literally just clicking every now and then to sort of go, you need to strike here. And then there's the apprentice blacksmith that has this enormous sledgehammer that will sort of really pound it into places and then the master blacksmith can just concentrate on deciding where that the metal needs striking at the time and obviously mm -hmm. we've, we've tried to represent that in anvil and sledge by you've got this uh, master blacksmith who has his giant shield and is more concentrating on keeping himself alive and deciding where the opponent needs to be struck in order to cause the most amount of damage and therefore you've got sledge who's going to be following shortly behind and sledge is being shouted at going look you need to go and smack him in the legs over there or whatever you know beat that guy across the head or he's going to have weak armor in the chest hit him in the chest etc and it's, it's that kind of thing we wanted to emulate with those two players um, but you'll also see this relationship between master and apprentice shown across the entire blacksmith guild so they've they're all going to be um not released in pairs but when we release a groups of, of, of blacksmiths in their boxes of six you know there will be three pairs in there three masters three apprentices and they will all have links to each other um so yeah that's perfect the, that's... certainly from what we've seen so far there are links both in that apprenticeship to master status as well as named links be that the, the like the named link between sledge to anvil or, or cinder to furnace from the four that we've seen thus far but of course with rules like and i don't want to sort of dive too deep into rules just yet just in case there's still people that were looking for a kitten video and have wandered on on here by accident um but there with with things like sentinel there is a, a direct relationship between between master and apprentice regardless of whose apprentice that is is that fair to say yeah, absolutely. So uh, there was certainly two different states that we wanted to achieve when it came to the sort of mechanical relationship here is that we didn't we wanted to give you a reason to want to play the blacksmiths in their pairs, but we didn't want to say you can only play them in these sure. pairs. You know, you've, you've got a lot of um, sort of cross pollination without a bet. You know, for lack of a better phrase, um, so that you know, you know, Sentinel is an ability that will work, as you say, with all different apprentices. There are a couple of those that exist throughout the Blacksmith Guild as well. So we okay. want to give you reason. So if you want to, you can mix and match different masters apprentices. You know, you get 
yeah, you'll probably get a more uh, a simpler benefit to use, the, or you'll, you'll probably have a simpler team to use if you do take the masters and apprentices in their pairs. But you can certainly mix and match different ones together. And we're interested to see actually what different kind of combinations people can mm. come up with, both inside and outside of the established pairs. Excellent. Excellent. So where is it you see um, within you know, within the current meta, for want of a better expression, where is it that you currently see the blacksmith fitting in terms of how how they play on the pitch? Um, well, as with as with sort of all guilds in guild ball, a lot of that comes down to what players the coach sort of brings to the field. Because you can mm. take a, a guild that's that we would designate as something of more of a fighter guild, like the Brewers, and you can take a team that consists of, say, Spigot, um, or veteran sure. Spigot rather, uh, Friday and Mash. And you've got quite a goal scoring oriented team there. So a lot of that does come down to player choice and how you play on the pitch. However, that said, they'll probably default to a sort of two goals and two takeouts, or four takeouts and one goal style victory win condition. So. Um, they they probably do it to err a little bit more towards the fighting styles uh, rather than scoring goals, but they are certainly capable. Uh, as you've seen with Cinder, they are certainly capable oh, yes. of banging, of banging oh, in yes. a goal or two. How much play style difference do you expect captain choice? Because of course, we with the it's worth mentioning the, the the forge master rule at this point. Probably that you know when when people have picked their team. Um, and it is currently worded that is immediately after picking a team before setting up um, that someone chooses a, um, a friendly master to be their captain. They gain a plus zero, plus two influence and that they are the captain for the game. So how big an influence do you expect that captain choice to be uh, you know, if, for a team that has both Anvil and Furnace in it for that first six that comes out um, and whoever the, the next master is that rounds out that set, how how nuanced a difference will a Captain Anvil compared to a Captain Furnace have on their, their disposition on the pitch? Um, quite large. And uh, I mean, you, you've seen you've only seen two Captain Legendaries so mm. far. And uh, even even the two that you've seen are quite different from each other in terms of effect. And one is quite yeah. clearly has an offensive effect and one quite clearly has a defensive effect. Now, the, the Legendaries are as different from each other as they are like from, you know, if you compare any two different captains within the game to each other, there are a lot of different Legendaries to choose from. They do have an immense impact on the pitch. And um, so it is going to be a big, you know, an important choice choosing your captain. And also for... Um, also deciding, determining, sorry, which player is going to be getting that extra influence cap benefit. So, you know, obviously for a player like Furnace, it's quite important if he can attack five players to put Searing Strike out, yeah. and, you know, as opposed to someone like Anvil, for instance. But the other thing as well that I want to mention in terms of this is it's actually a very unique thing for the Blacksmiths in that if you think about any other guild that you play with, if, when you're choosing between your captains, you're saying, I am playing with this one, but I am not playing with this yes. one. And you, you don't have that with the Blacksmiths. You can say, actually, this game, I want to play with 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 i do want to play with ferrite but i don't want to have her for her legendary play or i do want to play with anvil but i don't actually need that legendary play this game you still get to play with the player and that's something you just don't get with any other guild you're, you're actually saying i'm i'm gonna play with this one and i'm not gonna play with this one makes sense so how have you found the reaction to the blacksmiths so far because obviously so it's, we've, not, we've, we've not had a lot of information but i mean it's, it's certainly gained my interest as you may have noticed yeah i mean generally it's been very positive i mean um You'll always you'll always have a couple of naysayers, and that's just to, literally because we have so many different kinds of teams, and sure. we go for so many different visual styles and different play styles that you can't please everybody. But at the same time, we have that many different styles so that we can kind of account for everybody. Like there's going to be some, we're going to have something that you like. Just try it all. <laughs> um, so, but you know, but um, in general, it's been very positive, and there seems to be quite a lot of excitement for the rest of the blacksmith. So we're looking forward to it. Excellent, excellent. A couple of quick mechanical questions, if I may, Jamie. Um, in terms of how people construct their their six or their ten, um, whether that's building a team or whether that's building a roster, is that apprenticeship rule going to be applied across both the models on the pitch and off the pitch as well, or is that not really something we we're able to sort of look into at this stage? No, that's fine. I can answer that question. So um, when it comes to the, the sort of the amount of masters apprentices you have, that only really applies to the pitch to the teams on the pitch. Sorry. So when you're constructing, for example, a tournament roster, it doesn't really matter how many masters apprentices you choose to have, as long as you can field a legal team in every match. So you know, if you know, in theory, if there were enough of the blacksmiths out, that you could have a roster of 10 that consisted of three apprentices and seven masters if you really wanted to but you have to field those three apprentices in every match because you've got to have them on the pitch so that so. wording is is very very precise it is when picking a blacksmith team not when picking a blacksmith roster 
Absolutely, yes. Uh, roster right. is the term. So ro- roster is the terminology that we use for for picking. You know, as you say, your your, your tournament. Uh, you know, army list is yeah. a phrase that's used in a lot of other game systems. For us, it's roster. So when you're picking your roster, which is equivalent to picking your army list, writing your team sheet down for a tournament, then it doesn't apply there. It only applies to when you are playing the team on the pitch. But you, but you have to be able to field a legal team every time the, when, when you you know selecting your roster. So absolutely <laughs> makes sense. Absolutely makes sense. Lovely. Um, what for you? Um, has you most excited for what? is to come for the for the blacksmith release um genuinely just the reaction um i mean it's it's a it's a necessary evil of the of the job that i work in but we have to keep a lot of secrets and we work on things very far in advance i mean uh, work on the blacksmith started about a year ago um roughly give or take and so we've been we've been having these really cool ideas about the blacksmiths and playing these games of the blacksmiths that we just can't even talk about like you have to kind of assign it as a swear word in your head that you can't say blacksmith out in the public <laughs> when you're representing steamforged uh, until it comes to a point when it comes to the release of things now, it is it's something we have to do because obviously in terms of we have to think business sense etc about it's about the right times right times in which you allow information to release to the public but at the same time it just be kind of becomes like for lack of a better phrase we're almost like crack addicts for, for reaction because we're just like <laughs> we've known we've known about this stuff for ages and we're just like please tell us whether you like it or don't <laughs> they, 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 i know sure this is this is your prestige moment this is the the round of applause from the audience in many ways and of course like any performer right up into that final second you've got no real idea a hundred percent how it's going to go absolutely um, so i imagine butterfly is all round at the moment but hopefully uh, uh with the release of the box set at gen con or not released but the pre-release and the release later on in the year as we're all expecting um that that prestige will be exactly what you guys are after <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and it's not just about praise either. You know, it's, we we do want to know. If, you know, it's we're happy to listen to all the feedback where people. Obviously, it's always just opinion. But people, we're happy to listen to opinions of where people think we've gone right, where people think we've gone wrong. You know, and we'll take those things into account in terms of our future releases and stuff. There is there is lots of things that people don't realize how much. Uh, I mean, people sometimes do and don't. People don't realize necessarily sometimes how much just expressing their opinions can have an effect on us as game developers. We are listening. We are watching. Which sounds really creepy when I say it that way. But we know we do. We do look on Twitter. We do look on the forums facebook etc so we'd love to see these reactions it's both positive and negative uh, because it helps us not only um know where we're going right but also know where we're going wrong so that we can learn how to be better game developers in the future so. sure so speaking of, of reaction that seems a pretty good uh, segue to discuss the sort of the, the the elephant in the room for many people in terms of mascots or rather the lack thereof and whilst i'm not really want to sort of focus on uh, forum threads or or, in, or or Twitter feeds or anything like that. But what I'm curious about is the the development decision that led to removing something that many might consider a, a key aesthetic detail of Guild Ball that the, you know, that there isn't um, a mascot along with a captain. And was it purely the the dedication to that apprentice apprenticeship mechanic that sort of drove that decision, or was this a sort of something that we can expect to see in the future as well? Um. It, ooh. Ooh, there's a good little bit at the end of that question. Um, I suspect, <laughs> I, I, I have no reason to believe currently that this is something that we, we have no plans to repeat this process at the moment. At the moment, gotcha. we, as far as we're concerned, this is something that's unique to the blacksmiths. Um, no, no, I mean, we, exactly, can draw was, line, we can draw a line there and I shall, we shall infer no more information from that response. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's great that we have passionate fans, but, mm-hmm. uh, but I mean, when, as soon as the a next guild comes out that doesn't happen to have a mascot, it's it's fine for that to be a one-off. It doesn't necessarily signal the end of Guild Ball or anything like sure. that. I mean, and I, and and Phil Phil from Guild Ball tonight knows I'm talking about this in tongue in cheek. He knows that uh, Phil knows I love him, and he was the person, one of the people that had a particularly a bad reaction to the fact that there wasn't a, a mascot in the blacksmith. But that's fine, Phil. You'll get over it, and I love you. Um, but. <laughs> but um, but to be honest, the majority reaction about this has been perfectly fine. People are happy to accept that this is probably a one-off. It's a nice little different thing for the blacksmiths to have, and it's good for, for every guild to be unique in a number of different ways. This is just one of the ways in which the blacksmiths are unique. Um, sure. So, so was, it, was it that um, we want a master, we want an apprenticeship, we want that pairing? How do we make that happen? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can tell you the original conversation of how that happened, which is quite simply Matt Hart walked into a room and went, I want a team that's got no captains and mascots and then left the room. Um, and then <laughs> and then, and then, we sort of went, OK, and we sort of sat there and thought about it for a little while, had a discussion about it. And sort of the more we talked about it, the more we decided that we actually quite liked it and we'd like to explore this avenue. But it did mean, as you say, because we wanted to really you know, push the boundaries of how far we could push this Master Apprentice thing, see how important we really could make it to the core of the guild. It just meant that there probably wasn't really any room for mascots this time around. But, uh, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. As I say, it can, it, it can be a one-off. It can be something that people like, something they don't like. And if they don't, there are other guilds. So aside from composition, 
And you, you've, you've segued me beautifully here, Jamie. Thank you. Um, Very so, uh, <laughs> apart from, from that composition from the apprenticeship rule, what is it that you believe the blacksmiths bring to the pitch that uh, isn't present anywhere else? What is the sort of the, the USP, uh, that unique mm-hmm. gaming experience that the blacksmiths will have? So there's a couple of things, um, some of which are, are, are a little bit obvious and some of which are not, uh, some of which are a little bit more sort of subtle. Um, some of the ones we've actually talked about already in terms of the, they're breaking from convention, they don't have conventional captains, they don't have conventional mascots, and mm-hmm. therefore there are associated dif- differences in the way that the team is constructed. That's one of the sort of the more forefrontal ways. One of the, the slightly more subtle ways is, is actually just in terms of playbook construction. Now what you may okay. have noticed from, it's not necessarily too obvious on Anvil because he's one of the ones that, it, it, when, we, when we create a new mold, we almost instantaneously like to break it again um so but what we we have done with uh, a lot of the masters uh, is that they actually tend to have playbooks they're brewer playbooks inverted commas brewer playbooks where they, their playbooks are shorter than the amount of attack that they have this is something okay. that you've seen on furnace and this is something that you should expect to see on further masters in the future as well and what this is representing is that also their skill at arms and even though they're not too particularly interested in just you know dealing raw damage to the opponents it's representing the fact that they are there to support the team to do these momentous pushes knockdowns etc set up with their character plays and traits mm-hmm. But they are very proficient at doing so, um, so that if they happen to be in a, in a particularly good situation, they are more easily capable of wrapping their playbook from multiple effects, multiple pushes and knockdowns, etc. Sure. Uh, when it comes to the apprentices, we've done the opposite. And this is the most obvious when it comes to Sledge, is that they have yeah. longer playbooks than their tack. And this is supposed to represent the fact that they have quite a lot of potential. They are they, they are quite proficient, at, you know, as, as you've seen with Sledge, uh, they are quite proficient fighters on their own. But when they are under the tutelage and under the direction of the masters, then this can be driven up to 11. Um, and yeah. One of one of the other aspects of this as well is that normally a longer playbook than than your tack, so having more columns than you have an amount of base tack is normally seen as a bad thing, mm. just numeric just be, numerically because of how uh, you know the, the dice math works behind uh, guild ball playbooks is that if you can more easily wrap your playbook you can more easily spike damage uh, you know you can achieve higher numbers with things like tooled up because if you're wrapping your playbook you're benefiting from tooled up more than once you can generate more momentum so normally it's seen that if you have a shorter playbook this is a positive thing so instead we decided to sort of flip that on its head and say why why would you want there to be a longer playbook what reason can we give for that yeah. So suddenly we decided we, we that's when we decided, started to sort of reanalyze why we capped ourselves at the uh, previously highest damage numbers you've seen on a playbook result of four. Suddenly we thought, hang on, if you what happens if you just break that? If you can go longer than the playbook, but you break that, ce- that glass ceiling of four, start going to a sure. different numbers. At one point in playtest, Sledge had a momentous eight. We decided that's probably the glass <laughs> ceiling. We probably can't. We probably shouldn't go quite that far. We brought it back down to a seven again. But you know, it was worth testing out, and it was just trust me, it was fun for that short period of time. It lasted. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but you know, if you if you suddenly you know create this new glass ceiling where you can you can push these momentous damage numbers up to other different things you can think of, then suddenly there is a very good reason for wanting to get up this long playbook and achieve those final results, because then you can achieve some truly staggering amounts of damage that have different effects when they're combined with existing abilities. So if you wrap your playbook and you say you achieve seven momentous damage by achieving a momentous four damage and then a momentous three damage against an enemy player that has tough hide that's going to be reduced to five because you're Mm. triggering tough hide twice both on the four and on the three but if you hit a momentous seven damage once you're only triggering that once and you've actually got six damage through the tough hide so it actually has a different interaction with some of the existing defense to a tough hide one absolutely absolutely it is yeah Uh, and then suddenly that's cool you're taking the the momentous seven oh is that like a a three or a four no no no, that's six you're you're taking six (laughs) Uh, but at the same time but at the same time, it makes other existing abilities such as Tooled Up, which has previously been seen as something like one of the most important character players that a guild can have, suddenly has a little bit less importance to the blacksmiths yes. because yeah. they're not as interested in wrapping their playbooks as perhaps some of the other guilds are. I mean, I guess everyone's interested in wrapping their playbook, but they don't care about it as much yeah. because they've got these massive damage numbers in different places. No, so. Certainly looking at it and then through my own sort of playtesting or in Cage Ball with the blacksmith so far, you know, it's been very quickly Cinder becomes the more attractive target for Tooled Up. Um, compared to Sledge, purely because of uh, opportunity of usage, the fact that you know she's got the four influence over three, um, and a uh, just the opportunity to use it more, even though it probably wouldn't do as much damage, but it just seems to get more efficient use out of that ability. So certainly, tooled up has been a long conversation I've had locally when it's come to uh, application onto apprentices. So it's very interesting to, to hear you say that. Um, one of the other things. Uh, picked up on just when you were mentioning and it's a question i had sort of written down on my show notes for later on but i think it's only fair to bring it up now 
is if it wasn't the change of Momentous 8 to Momentous 7 on Sledge, um, can you mention anything else, sort of big changes that happened during playtesting from early stages? Mm, well, it's difficult to be enough. There's been quite a lot of different things. I mean, the different guilds and different players go through a lot. Sometimes they go through lots of changes early on. Sometimes they go through lots of yeah. changes late on, etc. Whatever depends on the thing that's being playtested. With the blacksmith, it tends to be quite front heavy. And what I mean by that is when we were still in the early concept stages, that's when they kind of went through a lot of changes. And then when we finally nailed down a concept that we were truly in love with, then it kind of just flowed quite smoothly from there, and there weren't that many dramatic changes from then onwards. One of the earliest things that we did, for instance, uh, one of the concepts that we didn't go with with the blacksmith, there was there was a little bit of a, too much of a focus on um, sort of the the products of blacksmith things. So there was too much emphasis on what armor do they have. Have, what weapons okay. do they have um, and that kind of led us to a team that would have just kind of looked like a group of knights on foot and that's not really what we wanted we didn't want no. just what the blacksmiths make we wanted to instead look at what the processes of blacksmithing were and how can we make the process is interesting and how can we bring that to the table in, in, in a cool way that, that is you know relevant to guild ball so um i think Equally, that... i imagine you you didn't want to be in a position where blacksmiths are putting down i don't know forge markers when you've just about the 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 farmers just around the corner throwing out harvest maskers and things along those lines absolutely yes so we need to make every guild unique and one of the other things that that we've um certainly been we think we've been better at in the last 12 months as well is making new guilds and new um new players more new player friendly as well so that's something that that's something that we didn't necessarily get correct with the hunters the first time around is that one of the bits of feed main bits of feedback we had from the hunters mm -hmm. back back in their original release uh, during season two is that they weren't necessarily the most new player friendly guild even though they were very interesting for sort of veteran players that understood all these interesting and little mechanical you know cool t tweaks and toys that they had so instead now we've had much more of a focus on how can we make this still interesting and still powerful uh, as, as powerful as we want it to be but you know it's good uh, good uh, what's the word it's a new player friendliness and you know a, a, an ability to be able to pick up and play straight away um, so yeah we don't we, we could have played around with lots of ideas like things like you say like we, no, this is something that we actually genuinely considered but we can play with things like, as you say forge markers whatever we also have to be very careful about not making things go too over the top for newer players um, and that's something that we've had a big focus on particularly with the blacksmiths and the farmers so do you because uh, do you do you think that the blacksmiths once they're released would be a good place for newer players to begin with I think so. I mean, I mean, let's be blunt about something. We're never going to be able to recreate the butchers and the fishermen ever again. They're probably two of the most simple. <laughs> they, are, they are. They are two of the most simple teams that we have in the game, and it's great that they exist. And they will always be sort of fantastic teams, just as the Brewers and the Masons are as well, which is why they're in kickoff. Really good teams for starters to be. And even though I would say the Blacksmiths are a good starter team, we've made we've done as much as we can to make them new player friendly. That they're just not going to be as simple to use as something like the butchers and the fishermen, because once you've created those very simple standpoints, you can't then recreate them because then you're just creating the same guilds over and over again you're not actually sure. creating anything you know new so, and exciting so you have a, a more footbally team in the fish and a more killy team in the butchers they're just reiterations of things you've already done exactly exactly so we've, we've got to strike a balance between new and exciting and new play friendliness perfect so one of my regular opponents on the channel and a good friend of mine locally um uh, john who plays uh, masons quite a lot locally was from right from the um and i hope he doesn't mind me using him as an example it was right from the very announcement of vengeance and even sort of pre-mutterings beforehand uh, he was terrified that all of his toys as a mason were going to be taken away from him and as soon as sort of and we saw the first look at anvil and he sees that that armor three the 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 the, the head goes down and the and the and the, uh, the complaining or not complaining because it was all in good spirits that they're exactly like masons it's just going to be another masons too and then sledge comes along with knockback and you know the the you know, comedy toys get thrown out the pam and <laughs> pram in an exaggerated fashion even more so how how important was it to you guys for this not to be masons too and how do you then ensure that that doesn't happen I mean, this, you, make, you make a very important point, and it's some, something that is crucially important. Whenever we make a new guild, it has to be visually distinct, visually unique, and it does it makes to make sure that it doesn't cross over into too much of the design space of another guild. Now, the Masons, they even whilst they have had typically the, the sort of the heaviest armor stats up until now, it's not necessarily one of the things that we would have as sort of the most defining feature of that guild, and it, it's something okay. that we certainly yeah. when fair. it comes to the black when it comes to the blacksmiths, if we're going to represent heavy armor, there aren't too many ways to do that other than to just give them heavy armor. You know? um, but one of, one of the things that we would have said about the Masons is sort of one of their core points that we really needed to make sure that we didn't overlap with the blacksmiths is in terms of their tactical flexibility. Um, and it's something that will always be key to the Masons. And it's something that we've actually just, just improved with the Arata to Hammer to make him a much more tactically flexible and versatile captain. Yeah. 
Uh, and the ability to sort of turn their plan, uh, you know, on a sixpence or whatever and just change around and go, actually, we're going to change our plan from, you know, um, takeouts to goal scoring or the opposite way around. is something that the Masons will always be able to do better than anybody else to be able to switch their plan in, a, in an instant. So, you know, do lots of... The other thing as well is... So, <laughs> If you're not talking about sort of team construction and instead talking about what actually happens on the pitch, yeah. the other thing that the Masons get more than anybody else is actually breaking core rules of the game. Everybody else is, stri- <laughs> is, is strictly limited to six activations. The Masons get a seventh if they take on. Mm. You know, um, and, you know, it, Linked as well is another one. Even though we've if duplicated Linked in another way, they were the first people to be able to go, normally you can't get one activation then change it to somebody else. Actually, we're going to be able to do this all the time as a core rule and it's really important to us because Honor and Harmony are two of the most centrally important players to our guild so in terms of sort of their tactical flexibility versatility and just sheer capacity to break core rules of the game i mean hammer can spend influence on other players you know to use yep. for himself yep. uh, you know there are I would say those are the core foundations of the Masons. Those are things that the blacksmiths are certainly not going to be as good at and you know, not going to be the same as the Masons in that sense. So is but, it going to be more to a case of the, the blacksmiths that once they start, once the sort of momentum starts building up behind them, that their path is, for want of a better expression, quite a linear one, that due to that lack of tactical flexibility, whilst you know full well that this enormous hammer blow is coming, it's then a case of preparing for it and dealing with it as best you can but that hammer blow is going to land pretty much exactly where you're expecting um i wouldn't say i think linear has perhaps been a touch too harsh i mean mm-hmm. there's still there's, there's going to be an ability for the for the blacksmith to you know alter their uh, alter their target choice and obviously it's down to the blacksmith player to play the team properly but there certainly is that element there that you're alluding to of the sort of the wind up and then the the use of <laughs> ex, ex, explosion of potential at the end of the turn i think that's kind of a little bit obvious from in terms of literally just if you analyze just how anvil and sledge works you've got the setup piece that will make sledge fantastic it's, it's not exactly unobvious to the opponent if somebody gets knocked down and singled out by by Anvil and Sledge hasn't activated yet. It's not going to take too many people, to, you know, sure. long to work out what's going to come be coming next. Um, and it is certainly is going to be a strength of people playing against the blacksmith that if they can see the, the the better they can see these things coming and the better they can interrupt these sort of wind up chains, then the better they're going to perform against the blacksmiths. And certainly higher tempo teams uh, are also going to be quite strong in that sense as well because they'll have a you know, naturally a, a better uh, chance at being able to react and, and change to an ever flowing situation. But the blacksmiths are going to be a, a touch more sluggish in this sense as well, and they're going to not going to be able to react as quickly to changing states on the board. But therefore, it's also therefore down to the blacksmith coach to be able to react as best they can and minimize the opponent's chances of being able to do these kinds of things so uh, as, as well as um you know buffs for friendly players that the masters are bringing to the table such as you know singled out and tooled up you'll also have a lot of debuffs that the masters bring to the tables as well and what the a blacksmith coach needs to do is to try to pin players down in place to prevent them from being able to get away <laughs> um yep. so that once they've done this bit of once they've done this bit of setup you know knockdown is quite an important one but people can you know people can clear knockdown there will be other abilities that will be available to blacksmiths to be able to pin down a player in place so that they can't you know squirm away way um at least in too much of a sense where it becomes a game and it becomes a struggle it becomes a tactical problem for both players to fix it's certainly not something that has been predetermined one way or another i kind of said that in a bit of a strange way but i hope that's all made no sense. no that makes perfect sense it makes perfect sense to me um just to ask a couple of questions um about furnace if i may um because i think it, it gives me a degree of insight into how the design process works in that we have see rules on his card which directly sort of play along to to the backstory or at least that which we know about it you know we can see the giant lava pot that he's got on his back we can see from his rules like tempered steel you know these are molten blades that he's currently working on so when it comes to rules like fire forged where uh, for those people that are unfamiliar with it that he ignores the first burning condition that's placed on it in what order do you do you come to that is that a case of right we need a model that deals with conditions in some way i want them to have some degree of condition resilience let's then put everything around that or is that a case if someone has whoever that is you know whether it's matt show and yourself jamie whoever it is that is in the office has come up with the, the concept of furnace carrying these these molten pots around with him and then let's put the rule around with it sort of you know is it a chicken and an egg scenario i guess to just to uh... yeah it is a little bit because there isn't really defined start and end point for it i mean um in terms of the in terms of the blacksmiths uh it certainly started off with the concepts for the pairs we started off with what is a good concept for a very for a couple of, of distinct pairs of master and an apprentice blacksmith okay. and, then, and let's go from there and then what we'll tend to do then is once we've got the concepts down and go this is cool this works this is something that they can relate to in real life etc mm-hmm. etc then we'll try and find something that makes sense for that play style and once we've established a few of those and we go okay this is the kind of team that's been building up what are the gaps that we can now fill in around it so we'll, we'll probably try and 
just naturally let the concept flow from our minds. And then once we've sort of done this, I'm going to do a really weird phrase again about this sort of mental diarrhea on the paper, then we'll kind of look, nice. oh, what are the different, what are the different areas that we can now fill up afterwards? <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, certainly not expected. Well, that's not where I was quite expecting that answer to go, but you certainly give us a, 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 a key insight into the inner workings of the steam forged offices <laughs> that uh, but I don't think any of us were expecting. Um, so, <laughs> Returning swiftly um, to, <laughs> to their place on the pitch, what do you think uh, in terms of the opponents, the guilds that we already see, who are they going to have a fantastic, who are the, the blacksmith coaches going to have a fantastic time against where they can get away with, with every plan that they've got in their head and who are they going to be the, the tougher matchups for them? Uh, it's a difficult one. It's a difficult one to pay an answer that down, down to mm. with that. Um, you know, because I, I wouldn't necessarily that Guild Ball is a game that's inherent to what people have particularly fantastic matches, particularly bad matchups. I think there's going to be a so case we're not there. Rock, of, paper, scissors. Here. Exactly. I wouldn't say it's a rock, paper, scissors game. Uh, at least if you've built your roster properly, you should be able to, uh, you know, account, if you're, you're going to an event, for instance, you should be able to account for basically anything that you're going to play against. There will be slightly more difficult and slightly easier matches, but it's certainly not a case of, there should never be a case of, I have lost this game before we've even started. Because if we've done that, then we as game developers have failed you. Um, you should always there at least be a game to be played there. Um, but in terms of sort of more general concepts, they're probably going to, as I alluded to a little bit earlier, they're going to struggle a little bit more against sort of higher tempo teams, teams with a little bit higher speed, mm -hmm. teams with a better goal scoring capacity than the blacksmiths themselves have, um, because they're going to, because of that high pace, they're going to have a sort of natural problem or a bit ability to. What's the word? The higher tempo team will have a good ability to change the pace and react better to what's going on in the table state. So if they can see this sort of synergy chain winding up in the blacksmiths because of their higher pace, they'll probably be able to react to it and get players out of danger faster than a sort of slower tempo team will be able to do so. Um, at the same time, teams that want to be able to fight the into the blacksmiths, it's that's going to be a very tactically interesting game because the blacksmiths can fight. You know, I wouldn't say they can fight as well as as the butchers in terms of like sure. raw damage, raw damage output. But in in the same way that sort of the brewers and the butchers are fighting each other, the brewers have got enough punch to be able to kill butchers. Uh, but they also have to rely on their resilience in order to win that game as well. And that's certainly the case with the blacksmiths. When they're having a straight-up fight, they'll have to rely on their resilience as well as their capacity to be able to annihilate enemy players. And it's you know, it's strengths and weaknesses. Plus, plus also, yeah, also it's with, with, it, it comes down certainly from, from like my own playtesting uh, of using them. Although yes, you know you you put um, furnace and anvil and sledge into people's faces. Certainly, sledge would be throwing damages out like uh, like no one's business. But he is certainly a glass cannon from my own experience. But equally, you know, throwing people into a fight and what I have found both anvil and furnace to be fantastic at so far is bullying position. Mm. Um, and whether that's you know going into like Tapper Brewers where he wants that commanding aura up, or whether it's um, you know the, the the owner aura for from Ox, if you, if all of these require a degree of setup um, from from the opponent, in just exactly the same way that a, that, a, that a blacksmith coach should be putting into it as well. Whereas you know going in with with uh, with Furnace and it's, that momentous double push is not a tricky thing to 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 hit in. Um, on either of the masters that we've seen thus far, and you can really sort of bully your way around into into people's fights without getting people to knock boxes off their character cards. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. It's uh, they the, the very original sort of day one concept for the masters is that it was they were supposed to sort of be these you know defensible positions, almost terrain pieces for the apprentices to be able to run around with. And what you see that represented as is the the masters themselves are quite difficult to take down. They are they tend to be more resilient than your average player, um, just as the apprentices tend to be less resilient than your average player. Uh, and you've also got sentinel on top of that as well, where you've yeah. got this sort of little areas of defense that are there. You know. There are areas where the apprentices will have an easier time surviving. And that's certainly the case in terms of how they're able to, as you say, maneuver enemy players around and bully their way into the board position so that they can sort of go, I am here, this is my tree. You know, I'm not having my tree, or this is my <laughs> this is or this is my hill, whatever, this is my place. You know, you are not taking it from me. And if you yeah. try to, then I'm gonna smash you away. I'm just gonna start keeping standing here and smiling at you. Um, so yes. Perfect. So, Jeremy, in terms of questions that I wanted to answer, I believe you've covered off everything. So, thank you very much for that. But is there anything that you wanted to sort of feel the, the information that, that perhaps, uh, not I'm asking you for spoilers or anything along those lines, because I'm sure we'll find that information a good time, but naturally you know a lot more <laughs> about the blacksmiths than I do. Is there anything that you feel to, to add to this conversation before we draw it to a close? 
There is something I've seen a little bit of speculation about, and it's something that I'm happy to reveal in advance oh. as well of, of, uh, of Gen Con. It's only a small thing, but uh, it's something that people have predicted already, and I've already seen a lot of conversation about it, is that, yes, it's, I can confirm that there are no unions that are allowed to play for the blacksmiths. Um, and I think that's when you when you look into the sort of the details of whether, um, you know, the master and apprentice relationship, how you're building a roster, it becomes a little bit obvious that you, you can't bring in other players. People have speculated whether, that whether you know, union players coming in would gain master apprentices. That's not the case. The union players cannot play for the blacksmiths in any capacity. So. Interesting. I look forward to whatever story Sherwin has that explains that isolation from the rest of the, of the, of the Guild Ball world. That'll be fascinating. Well, yeah, perfect, yeah. Jamie. Um, thank you very much for this time. The, I, I have one final question, which I must admit is purely for uh, an entirely selfish reason that I will you make a separate recording of and play back at a local opponent who's already faced my blacksmiths. And that's can I just ask you to confirm that that tackle on three for Cinder works with Hotshot? Yeah, absolutely it does yes so Brilliant. you can thank you very you know, much you can, you, you can, you can steal, <laughs> steal the ball out of someone else's hands if you want to you can pretend that she's tied a rope around the bolts or whatever you want to do in your in your, in your hand it's all about there's a little bit of imagination involved in these games isn't there but yes she Certainly. can absolutely shoot the ball you know what let's make it a bit more imaginative she shot the ball out of someone's feet it's ricocheted off a wall and it just happens to have found its way back to her and that's perfectly fine she can do that I love it Love it. I shall be playing that little uh, 30 second snippet of audio back to uh, Jay over and over again until uh, he <laughs> see, hears it in his nightmares. Um, Jamie, thank you very much for taking the time to speak to us this evening. We look forward to uh, to seeing what more information there is from Blacksmiths to come and have the best of times at Jane Con Chip. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. So a big thank you to Jamie. Certainly this is not something I envisaged for this channel originally and I was absolutely delighted to be able to uh, to be asked to interview him. Uh, if you have enjoyed it too and would like to see more of this kinds of nonsense, please subscribe by clicking the beard on screen now. Similarly, there are either side playlists for your delectation and enjoyment, and I shall see you all in September. Cheers!